Good morning, Dr. Fisher here this morning. I wanted to have a conversation, perhaps a sermon of how I understand love. You know, I understand love from the viewpoint of a fearlessness philosophy in psychology, sociology, politics, etc. So that's the key term, fearlessness, psychology, just for simplicity. And this is a obviously a theory that's developed from three decades or more, never mind my life experience before that, uh, which is very substantial and important to how I shape this understanding of fearlessness. And that really, the fearlessness teachings is really probably core to everything I do. But to do that and talk about fearlessness obviously invokes fear, the concept of fear. And so I have a whole philosophy and understanding and psychology, sociology, politics around theology, around fear. But to then invoke fear, you have to really, in the traditions of the wisdom teachings of this world that I've studied uh, in more or less different ways, that love is always invoked then with this notion of fear. So these are like capital F, fear, capital L, love, uh, capital F, fearlessness. So that's the quick start of how I organize reality, my experience, life. Didn't always start that way because I think I was born uh, with an intuitive sense of how love is coming to me as in a very concrete, pretty pragmatic way of caring, being cared for. And various reasons, I uh, won't go into it in this video, my autobiography is really one of seeing the holes, the breakdown, the over-reliance on love in, in family systems, and that includes my extended family systems into a Christian evangelical background on my father's side, going back several generations, and then, you know, just the entire sort of what I would call a overall a a good intention, but a lot of false hope on the power of love. That's a simple way to put it. And I'm very interested in how that relates to today. So this talk I'm giving you is going to have some examples from today of a couple movements, the Marion Williamson phenomenon, the Greta phenomenon, Greta Thunberg uh, phenomenon in climate change. She is now known as the Know, world's most famous climate activist, and Marianne Williamson is known as probably the most famous um, woman running for president in a long time, That especially in America, for the upcoming 2020 elections. As well as those two practical examples that I will apply this philosophy of fearism, psychology of fearism to, is sorry, fear, fearlessness. I used fearism there because I sometimes connect to, and this is not apologetic, it is actually very exciting to connect with the philosophy of fearism from Desh Suba out of Nepal. Another story, I put that in other videos and other talks, and I've written lots about that, so I won't go into fearism now and why that's an important concept. So philosophy of fearlessness, um, the Two examples I will give is a quick analysis of those two movements that I just mentioned, Williamson, Thunberg, uh, attempting to bring love back into the world um, so that we love this planet in terms of Greta Thunberg's night idea and ecology and environmentalists and many others saying that's what we got to do is love the planet more love ourselves more to love the planet more whatever the rhetoric may be uh, the new age and the human potential movement has been saying that for you know probably 60 70 80 years uh, in north america anyways and so there's this great promotion of love and that's what i'm questioning that's what i'm wanting to reconfigure with uh, uh, an intervention really that is think as a historical and evolutionary intervention to a higher developmental level where love is not so central. No, love is not the problem, but it is also not the answer, as many, many, many people have tried to promote, still promote, as in Marianne Williamson, President of the United States, 
uh, hopeful candidate is currently doing with her politics of love revolution. And there's been other kinds of revolutions. Revolution of love from the 60s uh, is famous, uh, really, and I grew up in that time period. And I was a big love promoter in certain ways, and I also was very critical of it. Just as I say in my autobiography, I was critical of my own family systems and watching how love was used uh, as a sign, used as the symbol, used as the, in fact, equivalent of God, uh, and still is in particularly the Abrahamic traditions, et cetera, et cetera. So love is very powerful, has to be dealt with, but uh, I'm saying it's not the answer and it's not the problem. The problem is where we're and how we locate love. So I'm gonna then jump in right now into a really practical story, uh, actually two little short stories of experiences I've had because really this philosophy of fearism, philosophy of psychology, philosophy of sociology uh, that I practice based on fearlessness as I've come to both understand the history of that tradition and I've complicated it and made my own theorizing around it and practices. So I'm going to talk about a short story which has to do with this beautiful pendant that I was given by a person who was diagnosed with schizophrenia and had a severe case of it, even though he was quite functional. And that came from the 1990s. He came and was one of the first people to join the In Search of Fearlessness Center that I and at that time Barbara Bickle helped uh, set up this center in downtown Calgary. It wasn't exactly downtown, it was a little on the edge in Altador community. Later we had another center in the core of downtown Calgary. These are kind of like an open mustard seed church kind of uh, analogy to that um, space where people could come. And it was really a strange experimental notion of how to build community by just opening the doors and putting up on the, the window um, in search of fearlessness center and research institute, which is from my academic side, but the practitioner in the service part of my work and life, it was at that time in the early 90s, devoted to In Search of Fearlessness as a path, as a, really as you can see here, I'm speaking an alternative or revisionist view of the place for fear. And I'm gonna suggest, quote, the correct place for fear if we're to be a sustainable, individual, collective movement and society. So it's a kind of worldview based on fearlessness. So that first story um, is really simply, and I'll keep it very short to get into the second story, which is even to me more powerful in how it influenced my life. But wearing this today really means a lot to me because Charles, this person who uh, I knew uh, came up and worked and sat around and visited me continually in the center. Not that he was had any reason to do so, but he was one of the first to walk by our center when we opened up in uh, 1991. And he lived in that community where we lived, uh, set up the center, sorry. And we also lived there, that's right, Barbara and I. And he would come to the office, open in the door, sometimes poke in, and then he'd close the door and leave. And I could see by the look of his face, and sometimes this was very early in the morning or very late at night if I was in the office, and he was always wearing the same heavily padded, down-filled yellow coat. And it was very dirty, and it was ragged head holes, and feathers were <laughs> leaking out of it, and... And it didn't matter what the weather was and what the season was. He, he always tended to wear that coat and he walked the streets a lot. Um, that was, I guess, in a sense, how he coped with his mental illness. And so a couple of times he would actually come in and uh, I'd say hi. And, you know, he, he wasn't like nice and social and he didn't have all the social graces because he was struggling with his own uh, life. 
and it was a very complicated life and a very challenging life. He actually was married as well and even had a child, um, but he was obviously suffering. But I really enjoyed his presence and the way he was actually attracted to this place. It was completely unique. A fearlessness center in the middle of your community, right in a strip mall, um, where he could open the door and, and nobody asked anything of them. He didn't have to believe in anything. He didn't have to read any literature if he didn't want to. And and sometimes he would, you know, make tea for himself in the back of uh, our small space of 300 square feet. <laughs> uh -huh. Very unpleasant time. He, he gave me this anyways at the end of many years of me working with him and him being part of the In Search of Fearlessness community here. And again, at that time, it was it was more or less just beginning. And, and then he was part of the, the thriving and growth of it. And of course, he was part of the, the disassembling of it um, in about 1998, 99. Anyways, the point being, uh, I really appreciate when he gave this to me, he said, um, you know, appreciations for the gift of fearlessness that I had brought to his life, even though he found it very difficult to work with and still had to be on his meds. He still had to go regularly to AA meetings uh, to struggle. And I won't go into why he had a very traumatized uh, life experience several that pretty much blew his circuits to, to be blunt but he also had great mystical experiences but when he gave me this he said this this is something i bought and i i wore and i wore it when i you know was with my girlfriend of um that died in a climbing accident that he was on and he sort of always blamed himself for her death that's just one of the major traumas and he said to me, it represents, you know, the grizzly bear paw print from an indigenous so Southwest Indian, um, probably Navajo um, symbol for when I looked it up, fearlessness, the grizzly bear um, representing the symbol of the West and the, the medicine wheel in the particular medicine wheel that I was looking at at that time. So I wear fearlessness uh, sometimes when I, just want to remind myself that that's what I stand for and that's what I'm here for on this planet. Uh, so that's the short of that. And I would say our experience together over all those years, probably about eight years, uh, was a deeply loving relationship, but we never talked about love. He never talked about love really, but he obviously had love crash on him in a masterful way <laughs> in his first great love that he put so much into and then, you know, she died very immediately on this rock climbing trip with him. And he wasn't there to be able to protect her and stop her. And I think it's an interesting metaphor for um, love is not the answer. Love is not the problem. But it's when you locate love as the um, absolute foundation for your connection with anyone. A person, an intimate other, family member and make it central to even your world view as in god is love for example that absolute absolute that becomes rigid and an attachment to this great love that is a wonderful feeling of course it is and it's a wonderful way to be in the world it's just when you locate it that's the problem from a fearlessness point of view as foundational, as absolute. And then you build this rigid identity of you either have it or you lose it. And that is a great dualistic problem that will undermine, in fact, in my arguments. Um, shouldn't have said a fact, but it's really a argument about the truth uh, of love that is not actually central and it is not foundational it is extremely important but i actually say that the experience of understanding fear our fear duality coming before our love duality our sexuality is actually more foundational won't go into that i've gone into that in many other my teaching videos and my writings so i'll leave that model uh, of the relationship of motivation from love motivation from 
fear below love and freedom above love as a higher meta motivational pattern and reality arguably in living organisms specifically humans so back to my second story now um, if i may i very much had a lot of difficulty when i began the in search of fearlessness project in this city of calgary alberta and i wanted it to be a world global project i wanted every city to have one of these fearlessness centers that i'm speaking about that uh, my friend charles uh, came to to work on recovery work on healing work on transforming work on bigger mystical realities that he was very involved in as a schizophrenic he had very powerful spiritual experiences did not integrate them very well fearlessness helped uh, somewhat i'm not going to say it was the answer uh, there was no answer he still to this day is still struggling the second story relates to that time because the new age movement was very strong the health and wellness movements in the 90s were just growing and burgeoning and so everybody wanted to get in and uh in my circles everybody um many people that were healing doing transformations some recovery work and so on they began to then form businesses and go and be speakers and healers and therapists and counselors and then just teachers and entrepreneurs and workshop leaders and facilitators oh my gosh it was it's a huge industry and of course, love was was so used to promote all or most of those ventures. So the story I'm going to focus on was a particular Kelly Toby, who is a teacher, student of Christopher Moon's at the time. Christopher Moon was a psychotherapist who really got into the spiritual side of healing and large group healing, particularly. And again, yet. Tremendous experience. He was also well trained as a psychotherapist, family counselor, or whatever. I think his exact background was. I'm not sure, but he, you know, wrote books and um, was doing the circuits teaching. And Kelly Toby was one of his participants in those uh, powerful group processes that Christopher Moon ran. And Kelly became one of his disciples virtually. Kelly Toby then, uh, as he was building his career, at the same time I was starting in this fearlessness center and doing my teachings more on fearlessness, uh, as, a, as I say, with this challenge to love, and that's not the central um, part of the fearlessness teachings, but it does challenge love and fearlessness also, I argue, ought to be replacing hope. And obviously hope, love get really hooked together. There are some of the great virtues, right, of the, the big traditional religions and many other even secular philosophies and ideas and just popular um, for the reason that they are very powerful concepts and powerful experiences and phenomenon this uh kelly toby invited me one time we, we had some sort of interactions a few as i reached out to him and first and then he sort of came and checked out our in fearlessness center on one of the open houses but of, which is not really a good way to understand what we were doing at the center at that time in the early 90s um, but you know he at least showed up and we were pleasant to each other and that kind of thing but he left and and, and then you know I could see he wasn't going to communicate with me anymore and I wanted to I wanted to communicate with all the wellness therapists and healers at the time um, because I was part of the city and I thought wow we could really do something in the city even you know change it in a major way by bringing this higher consciousness and our various soft technologies of change and transformation and then how could we bring that into the world in a political way to actually change the the very structures and the formations of how politics and the political life um, is obviously to me not and many others not adaptive to the kind of world we're going into in the end of the 20th century and of course the 21st century really blew apart um, and showed us that we're in deep trouble with 9-11 sort of being the iconic turn of the millennium so kelly toby invited me to this workshop that christopher moon was in town and he, he said you know i'll 
I'll offer you this for free. I can do that because I can bring one guest. And I said, okay. So this was after several years of him and I um, writing some correspondence back and forth and challenging. And I was also challenging other leaders and wanted to also have really good dialogues and, you know, fear and love and fearlessness and, and the kind of work we're doing. And I wanted to question, you know, this use of love for everything, putting it as the answer is so central, so foundational and so on. Well, generally those practitioners were not interested in what I was doing. They thought it was, I was too abstract, too heady and um, not enough in my heart. Critique you often get when you don't promote love as your first and foremost um, part of your metaphysics, part of your philosophy, part of your practitioner work. So he invited me to this conference, uh, not a conference, but it was a workshop for three days, uh, Friday night uh, lecture, and then two days of intense group therapy work with Christopher Moon. Uh, Christopher Moon, Moon is a you know, very experienced, very talented psychotherapist at that time. I could see that right away. I could see uh, his gifts and see the impact and the effect he has. And he really knows how to work a group really well. Uh, I'm talking a group of 40, 50 people. And of course, they're all keen to come because they want to get healed. Uh, so he had a very inspiring audience and they paid big bucks for it too. So when you pay more dollars, you're usually motivated to, to change more than if you don't charge much. And Fearlessness Center, we, we charged next to nothing because we wanted all kinds of people to come, including schizophrenics, alcoholics, and so on. At least people who were diagnosed with those and saw those as disorders of their life. Not that that makes them that kind of person. And so there's huge differences in our approach to group therapy and healing work and liberation. And that's what I use the word liberation. Christopher Moon did not use liberation, neither did Kelly Toby, nor most all of the human potential wellness community, they did not use that either. And um, that was core to my work. Uh, I see myself as a liberation theorist, teacher, pedagogue. Um, so Friday night, I was interested to watch. By Saturday, we got into the deep processing. People were crying, healing, you know, lots of work going on. Every individual in the room, Christopher said, you know, by the end of the weekend, we'd have a chance to as an opportunity, uh, they're invited to come into the center of the circle, more or less, and, and then he would process with the whole group, and the whole group would process with that person in some kind of way, and we did various exercises to to break us open, open our hearts, um, become, in a sense, a healing community, really, in a pop-up healing community for, for the weekend. And then, of course, we'd go home and often not know quite what to do with all that. Had a lot of those experiences through the 80s into the 90s so i wanted something different but anyways i went and i was a i thought i was an open-minded open-hearted participant as far as i knew and uh after watching uh, christopher's relationship with these people and kelly toby was his main support um, backup person as well as the, he had a team of people who were past students participants helping him who had gone through his workshops and had their lives saved or whatever it was, but you know, they're obviously disciples of his work. And so they're supporting the whole healing process. So great, great. It was again, a lot about love, played a lot of sappy, soft, powerful love songs uh, at very particular moments when people were wounded and needed to move to that next level of music often. It's very transformative. And so people were breaking down all over the place. And, you know, I had some, Tears, and, and this was not a new experience. I've done these intense workshops at different times um, for the last 15 years before then even. However, um, the moment of real potent experience for me, probably the place where I risk the most ever that I can remember of myself in ter terms of my vulnerability um, when it was my turn. I think it was on the third day or maybe it was the end of the second day. Yeah, it was. <clears throat> and I said, okay, I, I'm ready to take a turn. And I, I had this sort of vision of what I wanted to do with the circle and the group. And again, Christopher facilitating somewhat, but all unknown, really not knowing 
how he's going to facilitate working with me, not knowing how the group's going to work with me. But I did have an intuition. I, what I was, wanted to really do was I wanted to push myself, uh, in a sense, beyond my fear, beyond my, my protection boundaries of, of my ego, my myself, my status in the Calgary community as a teacher, healer, whatever you want to call me. I didn't call myself a healer at all. Um, but as a certainly liberation teacher and I thought, well, you know, I'm going to really push myself here. This is probably the best place to do it. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty safe environment. Um, at some level, but intuitively, I also knew it wasn't safe. And that's really the point of this quick story. Um, as I'll end it, that story and then move on to um, these more practical things I'm noticing in the world about really, uh, let's just call it the inadequacy of love or the misplacement location of love today and in the future and we need to make a big change there in my view so the moment i got into the center of the circle i said well this is what i want to do and uh, so i started rearranging the relationship of the support people and i said i want some new support people for me and so instead of what he called the angels of light who were supporting the group and holding space as they called it um uh, that Christopher and his team had put together, I says, well, you know, I, I just want to have some volunteers be supports for me. Uh, and I'm, I want them to be dark angels. Anyone who relates to what dark angels are, not just angels of the light, but angels of the dark. That's kind of my dialectic um, metaphysical viewpoint. I want both to be integrated, not just the light, the light, the love, love, love and light, love and light, which is very common in the, the new age uh, movement at that time in the holistic genre so uh you know okay so a couple of people volunteered to do those replacements and the other people i said you can go sit down take a break take a rest uh, and uh, had these new angels of the dark um stand and support the group and stand beside this behind their circle somewhat and just support the whole process i was going through so that was, that brought up a whole lot of stuff for people. And, and I was just kind of, I was watching Christopher Moon and see what he was thinking. He didn't intervene. He, he said, seemed to think this was okay, cool, interesting process. This guy's unique, whatever he's doing. So I just kept risking and I kept risking. And I won't go into the details of the story. It's too long. And I don't have a really good memory of it all, what I did. But I basically replaced the love and light attachment and the attachment to Christopher Moon. And I took charge for my base and time to be the leader of my own healing process based on fearlessness is what I told people. I gave them a little quick background that I'm, you know, running this fearlessness center in the city and so on. Uh, Cause a lot of people, most people there did not know me. Um, Kelly Toby and that's maybe about it, maybe one or two, maybe had heard of me in my work in the city. So my, the difference, right? This contrast of, relocating uh, love and putting fearlessness in, in a sense more at the core of the liberation and the healing processes and so on. Well, it just totally disrupted this, this group who were all so amazingly loving toward each other and what was going on and supportive. And, and the attacks came one after another from, because it's a free circle, so people can just speak when they need to, say what they need, feel what they need. And so, you know, it's truth and honesty, reconciliation. And I just received, I said, I'll just receive whatever you, you want to respond to. And what I just did by restructuring this relationship and um, relocating myself in Christopher's kind of place as a kind of dramatic play acting, which I do these kinds of performances, but it was incredibly authentic and I was incredibly vulnerable. I was shaking and trembling and sweating like crazy um, going through my own healing process. And I was ready to walk that path. And as I say, the most important thing is just to watch. And I was validated deeply of how attacking people will move from love when we're all in the same and we agree to when you disrupt and disagree you know, with some very fundamental principles or of their belief systems, their worldview and their attachment to that worldview of quote love based reality and so on spiritual that went with that and oh my gosh folks it i can't 
say more because really it needed to be captured on video what transformed in that room so quickly to a viciousness to even a kind of hate and spitting um, personal attacks uh, some people are attacking in the process of what i was setting up they didn't trust and uh, that's what it was it was fear their fear and mistrust of anyone else um having another view and or you know just even for my 15 to 20 minute session uh, of getting attention why didn't they give me the same kind of attention that they gave other people for the last day and a half uh-huh yeah that was really validating to my ongoing and since then challenge of the misplacement the misidentification and location for love and the centrality of how that then gets hooked to some authority and in this case it was this group completely had got themselves in a kind of cultish space really uh, kelly toby being one of the prime uh, movers of that as well and he even attacked me later and said you know how dare you do this and you obviously came here with no intentions for love and healing and blah 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 well i didn't even argue with him he was so upset and he was so emotional and so attached to his leader his guru i think you get the picture of that story i learned great lesson there and grew from that and hopefully didn't become too bitter you know for too long but that doesn't mean i don't taste the bitterness of that experience and many others where i have challenged because uh, you could walk into a christian church and i did sometimes and i or christian groups and study groups or um, education groups who are alternative groups and believed in another belief system based on love or some other guru's teachings and i, I was always one to be able to stir those up and um at least put in some different viewpoints and, and, and relocate and just see what would happen and see how authentic quote people are and how much fear is sitting underneath their so-called belief in love and their commitment to love and uh, as a therapist and a, someone who worked with kids and youth and families for many years um, i learned the same thing same with teachers who say they love their students and then i watch how they actually behave and as soon as they're threatened and fear-based anxiety is uh, aroused in them uh, in all kinds of different situations which rightfully so they they, they might experience fear um that's not the point it's just then how quickly love dissolves and then of course i could go into all my three relationships major intimate relationships i've had uh, relationships with my children and again watch how quickly love dissolves because uh, that's the point of the videos i will now move to these two examples of the greta thunberg effect and marion williamson phenomenon and the extinction rebellion is part of the greta thunberg phenomenon i've done some videos on the extinction rebellion movement right now so i'll focus on those two because the extinction rebellion let me start there first um is coming out as this new climate activism right as you know uh, coming centering out of the uk um, become a global movement extremely quickly um, people being arrested uh, on the streets and they want to be arrested uh, they want to bring this change so we reduce our carbon outputs of societies and all this good eco stuff and one of the things that they put in their brochures and their principles and they put it at the ends of their letters when they're talking to people and they invite people to go and protest with them is you know we're doing this all based on love you know with love with love with love that's our highest principle not fear and they, and they more or less say that over and over um and they talk about beyond politics and really they're talking about you know let's let's do this based on love let's make these changes let's not be violent right non-violence is a big part of their uh platform philosophically spiritually etc not that they're a spiritual group per se and i've watched that and i've had several interactions and attempting to reach out to people in that community uh, because i thought you know I have something to say I've, I've been interested for 45 years in, in liberation and environmental issues and how we're going to move into a different kinds of you know emancipatory communities and restructure the world and I, you know that's my love all that stuff and it's my path of fearlessness that guides me into that manifestation of my love for restoration 
uh, reclamation, healing, transformation, to live a life where we are not suffering to the same degrees unnecessarily that we do and cause to other creatures and beings on this planet. Well, um, what I've noticed is that uh, there's there's not so much love leading that move, leading that movement, and there's not so much love um, that seeps down through the movement as far as I'm concerned. I'm not saying there isn't any. I'm not saying that it isn't beautiful at times. I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying I can see by all kinds of ways that they have their own hidden agenda of politics and exclusions within their movement um, where they're not really willing to follow the path of fearlessness. They do not use the word fearlessness, so which, which amazes me, especially when they're supposedly based on nonviolent action and the traditions of Gandhi or Martin Luther King and so on. Um, but fearlessness does not enter their discourse. They prefer love. Of course, Gandhi used love. Of course, Martin Luther King used love and other great leaders, Nelson Mandela and so on. However, uh, I've often, you know, reinterpreted and tried to understand as well those philosophies of change and nonviolent action and political action and so on. But XR Rebellion is doing what they're doing and you know there are a lot of young people and some not and um, they're going to do their way and call it love and they're going to have to learn from that. Um, I kind of see the analogy of they're, they're still not actually interested to look at the shadow side of love and uh, locating it so central uh, and yet to me they don't really have the basis for it and I think um, that drive that they're showing XR Rebellion um, the drive that they're showing that's my whole point of, in some sense of this video in the last few minutes is that this drive to try to get love to 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 recentralize to re-foundationalize because people feel that sense of crumbling and chaos and hatred fear growing in the world anxiety uh, the sense that chaos is not far, cascading types of collapses and crises. So there's a bit of emergency, right, that's being hyped. Greta Thunberg being part of that emergency warning system. But Greta Thunberg, as much as she's been adopted by and many of these eco-organizations, XR Rebellion being one of them, and she's adopted them and in some sense endorsed them, uh, participates with them, but she's doing her own thing, uh, good for her. 16 year old, making up her own mind in certain ways. Um, there's a fascinating contradiction. She's the most famous climate change activist. Virtually all the eco movements, XR Rebellion included, want to be attached and connected to her because her publicity uh, scope and power is amazing in the media. She's just got all the right accoutrements at the right time in history and Greta never uses the word love as far as I know. I could be wrong on that, but I never heard her use it in her speeches that we should be more loving. No, she isn't. And, and, and so you get kind of these love being trying to recalibrate itself to, to hold this chaos, fear, terror, mortality, massive extinction perhaps the end of world history as we know it as humans, not the end of life on the planet. And, and there's this amazing contra contradiction that you know, Greta doesn't use the love thing at all. So I'm very interested in that. I have my critiques of Greta, as you know, if you watch any of my last couple of videos on the Greta effect. It's not just critique of Greta, it's the effect and the building around her and, and the hope and stuff. But she keeps saying, I don't want your hope, I don't want your hope. Just do action, just make it, make a difference. I want you to panic, actually. So there's a real contradiction in the philosophical, metaphysical, and psycho-emotional framing, uh, and obviously the biography of Greta and her uh, particular Asperger's syndrome dynamics. And then the XR Rebellion movement, you know, love, love. And so leave it at that. I think there's a real huge contradiction. I think it's going to crumble and or tumble and try to 
see where it's going to come on the end. And I want to watch that, be part of that, and be helpful to it if I can. And that's why I'm here, really, is uh, giving my sermons or consulting or just being myself, being an artist, uh, all the things that I do to uh, attempt to bring uh, maybe some new perspectives and so fearlessness would be one of them. And today I'm not going into what is a fearless in psychology or philosophy, et cetera, as I said, I've done other videos on some of that. I've done a lot of writing on that available online for free downloads. Okay, so um, the next movement uh, of, that's trying to recalibrate, re bring back the salvation of love um, is Marion Williamson. And I'm doing a lot of writing. I've got a book proposal out to, to study that phenomenon today in American politics, but it's of course much broader than American politics. It's, a, it's really a, an international uh, awareness of the chaos in the global sphere. And a lot of people are gonna be reaching for, as she does through a very spiritual and religious background that she brings a, a course in miracles is one in her jewish background and of course part of the judeo-christian tradition but she's very interreligious and interspiritual and a very advanced mature person uh, amazing in so many ways but i've spoken about that in other videos i won't do that here she's trying to relocate love as central again and she her latest book is the politics of love yeah, basically toward a new American revolution, evolution of consciousness and moral repair and so on and so on and so on, her politics. So I just wanted to parallel those two movements, XR Rebellion, Marianne Williamson particularly, and uh, the repositioning of love, as I say, and I would say love is basically being pulled apart uh, we all feel it or those particular movements and leaders feel it and they feel that this is totally dangerous and will take us into a nightmare of hatred, violence, destruction, chaos, domination by vigilante groups of all kinds and wars ultimately of all kinds within countries and between countries and on and on to you know, exacerbated terror of nuclear war with rogue states and non-rogue states who also have massive amounts of nuclear weapons, all driven by fear, mistrust. And that is really the fragmentation of love that has been going on for a long time, I'm just gonna say for now. Um, particularly their love has been placed as and is continuing to be replaced in these what I would call romantic revival movements XR Marion Williamson um, how a lot of people respond to trying to get hope again love again these great virtues again so going back to you know the great America dream the great idealism the great utopic notions even though these people you know are, i'm speaking about right now are very aware of what, you know there's no utopia coming around the corner here and they're not talking like utopians so thank goodness i think they realize we're in a postmodern or metamodern condition which is um, not one where utopias fly very much anymore and i don't think they ever will again in the same way, but that doesn't mean you don't have a in total utopian impulse to reclaim and bring what you think is the savior. And so they all have their own saviors. And so I just wanted to point that out. And I think that will be the downfall of humanity to be blunt, as uh, to continue on that savior complex of right for now, the sign of that savior is love. So uh, I'll end the video there with a controversial note and a lot of incompleteness and the puzzle still being stirred on the table. Um, but that's the whole process of the fearlessness inquiry uh, that I bring to the table. So um, look forward to any conversations, make your comments below if you wish, and uh, let's keep the conversation going. Good day.